to deal with the matters that have been presented and the question mark is still there. I have thought it would be interesting just to pass out sheets of paper and to see if anyone in this audience without any coaching or without any help, just based on the uh, speeches that Brother Blakely has made, could write down a single passage of scripture or a single argument that he's made or any uh, presentation that he has given that would justify, and I must be careful and not say authorize because he's already told us he rejects the idea of authorization altogether, but that would justify the use of mechanical instruments of music in the worship of God in this dispensation of time. Remember that his proposition is in the present tense. He talks in his proposition about what is now. He talks about instrumental music being uh, available to us now. But in his argument, he talks about David. In his argument, he talks about Saul. In his argument, he talks about the Old Testament. In his argument, he talks about the tabernacle. In his argument, he talks about heaven. In his argument, he talks about everything except what is in his proposition. And I want to hold that before us tonight, and I want to hold it before him. That he has not sustained what he agreed to prove in his proposition. His proposition does not say that instrumental music was unoffensive to God in the Old Testament. His proposition does not say that his proposition was unoffensive to God in the days of David. His proposition does not say that uh, instrumental music may be acceptable in heaven. His proposition deals with the here and the now. And I have challenged him. I have pled with him. I have begged him, Brother Blakely, give us a passage of Scripture, whether it is authority, whether it is justification, whether it is simply to show that something is scriptural, Please give us the Word of God to justify the position that you hold and the position that you practice and the position that you proclaim and the one that you cling to, though it has created and caused division in the body of Christ. Where is the passage of Scripture that sustains the proposition that he agreed to prove? He has not given it. He has not produced it. There is not a person here who could write down uh, such an argument or such a passage of Scripture on a piece of paper and take it home with you and show to your friends who did not come with you to this discussion. And then, of course, Brother Blakely says that uh, we are under law to Christ, but that is not the law of Christ. But what he wants to say is that we're under law to Moses. He uh, is trying to bind the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments on us. And uh, it surprises me how that he is so inconsistent in this regard. He uh, referred to Acts 18 uh, through uh, 21 and uh, talked about the experience of Paul uh, and the vow. I asked him what I've asked him about these other arguments he's endeavored to make. Does that bind upon us the entire Old Testament system? Does that bind upon us all of these other matters besides the instrument? How is it that he determines that he's going to bring one thing over that he wants? He leaves everything else behind. How is it that he justifies taking what he pleases and leaving everything else? I can show that uh, burning incense was unoffensive to God in the Old Testament. And if his argument that God never changes, the nature of God never changes, means therefore that everything that was once unoffensive to God would still be unoffensive to God, even though there's no authority for it, even though it is not in truth that is directed and guided by the truth, then of course he'd be bound by these things that he says we do not have today. And then I was interested that he quoted uh, Romans 3 and verse 19. Why he said, uh, that verse says, that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. And he asked me the question, uh, is that the law of Christ? Why no, uh, that is the law of Moses. And that's why that it doesn't have any application to us. That's the very principle that is under consideration there. When it says whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to whom? To them that are under the law. That's what is under consideration in Romans 3. And as a matter of fact, what is being done there is to show that both Jew and Gentile are under sin. And he quotes a, a group of passages in that uh, context to show that uh, there's none that doeth righteous, no, not one. Follows that up by the uh, statement that is cited here, whatsoever things the law saith, except to them that are under the law. That is to say these uh, principles are applicable to the Jews and therefore is to show that they are under sin. Now, if Romans 3 and verse 19 is true, and it is, 
whatsoever things the law says except to them that are under the law, I want to know how he gets back under the law. How do you as a Gentile, listen to me now, how do you as a Gentile qualify to get under the old Mosaic dispensation? In Exodus 20, it was addressed to those whom the Lord God brought out of Egypt. That doesn't apply to you. It applies uh, to those that it was addressed to. And I'd like for him just to explain to us how that he as a Gentile comes under the law. But I want you to notice, I said a minute ago he's inconsistent about that. He uh, says that when he came into Christ, he got out from under the law. Now one time he tries to justify his position by the law. Next thing you know, he says he's not under it. Well, I want to know how he gets justification by that, which he's not under. And then he said, I'd be offended to associate the law of Christ with judgment. Well, Jesus said in John 12, 48, uh, the word which I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. And then he said, oh, yes, uh, I agree with the scripture over there on his chart. I didn't know he'd ever seen that chart. <laughs> <laughs> I was delighted tonight to find out he had noticed it had a scripture on it. It's been up there now for four nights, and I've not been able to get him to deal with this chart. There's passage after passage after passage on that chart to which he's never made one single solitary allusion until this good hour. And I have up there ten things that are characteristic of instrumental music relating to the passages that are on that chart. He's never so much as discussed the first one of them. I presented them in the first affirmative speech that I made on the first night, and he never has gone over there and said one thing about them. But finally tonight, he noticed Romans 15 and verse 4. That says whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And then he said, but not about music. I thought he might have been just a little bit uh, playful with us in that regard, but that's all right, because whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, and we learn where music was. It was under the law. And uh, if he thinks just because everything that was written for our learning is for us today, he still hasn't dealt with the fact that uh, they were not only to praise God with the instrument, but with the dance. Psalm 149, also Psalm 150. Why does he deal with that? He just observes the Passover on that and passes right over it. Then he goes back to Romans 14, said very little about it this time, but he said, uh, scarcely could be a matter of indifference if a man is damned if he eat. But I stated earlier that the condemnation there is for a man to do that which he conscientiously believes to be wrong and thereby to violate his conscience, not because that the matters under consideration are not matters of indifference. He said nothing about the passage that I gave in that regard in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 8. And then he says uh, again uh, in a playful mood perhaps, nothing is unclean of itself. And then he says unless it's the musical instrument. Well, I thought he was talking there about things uh, that they took to eat, uh, Brother Blakely. You weren't planning to eat the instrument, were you? I don't know how you apply <laughs> Romans 14 to the instrument of music and the instrument of music's not in the category of things in Romans 14 because those are matters of indifference and uh, this is something that involves a matter of faith we pointed out in the very first night that whatsoever is uh, to please God must be a faith without faith it is impossible to please God Hebrews 11 6 faith come of the hearing hearing by the word of God Romans 10 and verse 17 no word, no faith. No faith, no walking by faith. No walking by faith, no pleasing God. Presented that in our first affirmative, he said nothing about it to this good hour. Then uh, Hebrews 8 and verse 10, uh, he doesn't want there to be any laws in the covenant, and yet uh, it is said, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Uh, he Not like the covenant that I made with the house of Israel and the house of uh, Judah. I will put my laws in their hearts. Put what in their hearts? Laws. Law! That's the very thing that he says is not there. And then in Romans 7, he says, we are dead to the law, so we're not under it. You get that? He said, we're dead to the law, so we're not under it. Well, if we're not under it, then we're trying to prove instrumental music out of it. And then uh, he talked about instrumental music being before the law, uh, Psalm uh, 81. And he said it was also during the law. And then he wanted to say also that it uh, will be after this dispensation in the heavenly state. That's exactly the argument the Sabbatarians make. Let's look at chart 38. I just think it's interesting. He's made Sabbatarian arguments almost throughout the discussion here. His arguments parallel the arguments of the Seventh-day Adventists who are trying to prove the uh, Sabbath day. 
and uh, he's uh, tried to establish the Decalogue. I've asked him how he's going to uh, keep from uh, following the Sabbatarian position since the Sabbath law, the seventh day Sabbath, by the way, is a part of the Decalogue. Exodus 20 and verse 11 says the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Never has answered that. Now look at this. Sabbatarians argue that the Sabbath was before the law, Exodus 16 and verse 23. And then the Sabbath was also during the law, Exodus 20 and verse 11. And they likewise argue that the Sabbath will be in heaven, Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. And so they do the same thing that Brother Blakely does. They get it everywhere except the place where they need to prove it. And that's what he's not been able to do, and he makes precisely the same argument they make. I want to look just briefly to it, chart 29. He's talked about this matter of uh, authority, and uh, he talks about these various acts of devotion that were performed. Of course, uh, you remember in Matthew 9, 4, it said Jesus had power on earth to forgive sins. Our Lord was able to do many things while he was here upon earth because he administered his own will. Not only that, but there's generic authority under the old covenant for acts of devotion in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. But here's the question that I've asked of him. Number one, this argument by implication concedes that the use of instrumental music is unauthorized. In other words, when he gives us all these illustrations, the alabaster box and the washing of feet and so forth, and says that the authority is not necessary, that is conceding that he doesn't have any for instrumental music. That's point number one. I've asked him why cite authority from the scriptures for the proposition that no scriptural authority is necessary. That's a self-contradiction in which he's involved himself. And then I pointed out what the real issue is here. What about those items that were actually specified under the law, as our worship is under the New Testament? Does Mary's act of devotion imply she could have observed the Sabbath on Monday, or perhaps only monthly, or that she could have served as a woman, as a priest, or that she could have had a pig offered as a sacrifice? Now, if the answer to that is no, please explain why. I presented this to him earlier, and of course he's never dealt with it. Uh, his uh, idea does not fit his case. That's the problem. Uh, he uh, cannot show how that uh, her act of devotion excused her from compliance with that which God had required. And that's all that we're saying in this case, that our worship is to be in spirit and in truth. Then uh, I want to deal just a little further with his idea here about heaven. Let's have chart number 18, and after that, 18a. His heaven argument basically is this. Everything mentioned for the praise of God in heaven is permissible for praise of God on earth. Instrumental music uh, is mentioned for the praise of God in heaven. Therefore, instrumental music is permissible for the praise of God on earth. Chart 18a, I ask this question. Will he accept the consequences of his own argument? The burning of incense is mentioned for the praise of God in heaven. Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4. The golden censer and the golden altar are also mentioned in connection with the praise of God. Revelation 8, 3, the temple and the tabernacle. Revelation 11, uh, 1 and 2, and chapter 15 and verse 5. Now, will he take... Uh, all of those are just what he desires. And then uh, I was interested, too, in the way that he phrased that a little while ago, just about the time that he quit, about the last uh, statement that he had to make to us was, he said he just knew that whatever uh, God did in heaven, he wouldn't prohibit here. Well, I wonder about the other way around. Uh, Matthew 22, in marriage, uh, in the heaven, there's neither marriage nor giving in marriage. <clears throat> Brother Blakely, you may be in trouble. Now, well, he can't, it's getting hot over there, isn't it? He's answering me now from his seat. I, I knew it'd get warm. <laughs> he, <laughs> he's worried about it, and I can't blame him. <laughs> he'd feel better if he could find that verse of Scripture, and he just hasn't been able to do it at all. Well, he says uh, instrumental music was commanded. The Old Testament never uh, countermanded in the New. No, the entire Old Covenant was done away. That's what happened in that case, as we have abundantly shown. Furthermore, uh, he says, he talks about burning of incense, and he says he's so worried about the burning of incense. Now, watch what his argument is to that. He doesn't show you why it would not be allowable under his argument. That's the reason I brought it up. I said the principle that you set forth would justify it. And so uh, the only way he gets around that is this. He says, we don't see us doing it, do you? No. But the only reason is because you have not followed the logical consequences of your own argument. It would allow it. And he said to me, well, the same thing about a rosary bead. He said, you couldn't get those from uh, his brethren. Well, I couldn't get them from mine either. I had to go to the Catholics to get it. <laughs> but let's 
look at chart number 12. And we'll see that uh, some of his folks have followed his argument to its logical conclusion. He may not have, but that doesn't mean some of the rest of them have it. Where will the road of apostasy lead? Look here what laid down in a Christian church preacher over in uh, Joplin who's been at this debate, said in spring 88 in his paper, is it allowable to use prayer beads? Those who imagine they are helped by them surely have a right to use them without not interfering with them since God made no law restricting their use. What's he doing? He's using Brother Blakely's argument. Where is he going? Running over there with the Roman Catholic ritual using his rosary beads. Now, that's what I'm pointing out. I'm not saying he has them. I'm saying his argument would justify it. And he has not been able to show how that his argument would not lead to that conclusion. And that's the problem that he has all the way through. He talks about one sound from the tabernacle. What he needs to find is one sound from the New Testament church. He says... Uh, the hand of God was on uh, those that played the harp in the Old Testament, and David uh, played the harp before Saul. What does any of this have to do with the worship of the New Testament church? Why, he gave every passage in the Old Testament that would not establish his uh, proposition tonight, and the very fact, friends, that he must rely on those passages and that line of argumentation shows the poverty of his cause. Don't you know that if he had New Testament authority, he'd give it tonight? Don't you know that he would love to have a passage tonight where he could just stand up here before us and say, well, Brother Hires, we're practicing uh, what the New Testament church did, and we're trying to be New Testament-oriented uh, in our thinking, and here is what the New Testament church did, and here's book, chapter, and verse. He'd be thrilled to death if he had a passage like that. If we have time, let's get chart number 19. This is his no-law argument, again, stating uh, his argument for him because uh, it takes a good long while sometimes for him to state it in a precise form. We'll boil it down, and I believe this is essentially what he's saying. If it's not, he can tell us. Everything acceptable in praise to God which is not specifically condemned. Instrumental music is not specifically condemned. Therefore, instrumental music is acceptable in praise to God. Now, chart 19a, will he accept the consequences of that argument? Is praying to Mary specifically condemned? Is counting rosary beads as an act in the aid of prayer specifically condemned? Is dancing specifically condemned as an act of praise in the public assembly? Is the burning of incense specifically condemned? How do you justify one and reject all others? Let me have chart 42. I want to show you what it is that Brother Blakely has not given. And uh, you'll notice those words. <laughs> chart number 42. Uh, I want to uh, emphasize uh, not giving Blakely, but what Blakely has not given. Number one, he has not given the passage authorizing instrumental music in Christian worship. Two, proof that the law of Moses is binding today. Three, proof that those accepted with God can improvise their own worship system. Four, evidence that worship is just an emotion, not act. Five, proof that there is a law in the heart that is special illumination separate from objective New Testament revelation. Six, proof that John 4.24 is not a comprehensive definition of Christian worship. Seven, proof that there are no commandments in the New Covenant. Eight, proof that there are possibly no laws regulating the worship of God. Nine, proof that heaven provides a pattern for earthly worship. Ten, proof that sin deals only with matters of the flesh, not with things pertaining to worship. Eleven, proof that knowing God allows license to practice will worship. And twelve, an honest acknowledgement that he has abandoned the position of his predecessors. Chart number 40. And this will be the last that I refer to in this address. I've already referred to this before, but this is the statement of Brother Fred O. Blakely from volume one of his uh, book, The Apostles' Doctrine, and I think it's such a fine statement, I want to introduce it on the chart. He said, it seems that our Lord's teaching on the subject is summarized in two of his well-known utterances. He refers to Matthew 15, 9, and John 4, 24, which he calls that comprehensive definition of Christian worship. Every night, I've asked Brother Blakely to deal with that statement right there. Acceptable worship is inseparable from teaching and obeying the truth. Not one night has he said anything about it. Well, I guess I'll reveal now where I got it, Brother Blakely. You wouldn't say anything about it. Here's what your father said. Thus it is seen that our Lord and the apostles inseparably associate true teaching and obedience to the truth with God's favor in worship. Unless the doctrine is right, men's worship will not be accepted of God. It matters not how sincere they may be in offering it. Further, the necessity of strict adherence to the divine revelation in the worship and service of God is vividly illustrated by these 
famous biblical tragedies. Watch what he gives. The rejection of Cain's offering, Genesis 4, Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, and the curse visited upon Isaiah in 2 Chronicles 26. Thank you, Brother Fred O. Blakely. <laughs> glad, uh, Brother Harris, Brother Jackson, <coughs> and all of you that have been with us. I'm, I'm glad that uh, I've had this opportunity to meet many of you and now to present the closing part of my soul in this debate. It's been a good one, hasn't it? I, I, I have enjoyed this because it has exposed a lot of uh, our minds to things that frankly I can speak for brethren on my side, they don't it kind of runs in some of this stuff. And I'm thankful that we can be exposed to this and now it gives us opportunity to weigh these things and to examine them to see whether they're of the Lord. You, un you understand that the ultimate determination is not how well Brother Heyer says it or how well I say it or how much he's convinced or how much I'm convinced. You are the ultimate judges of this issue. And it cannot be determined by which one of us said it best. It has to be determined by how it measures up to the Word of God. Now, I want to uh, make just a few observations here. First of all, that, that uh, last display, that last chart that was displayed from my father, as Brother Hires has, <laughs> as he said, this is what Blakely has not given, and I'm trying to bring Hires higher. <laughs> <laughs> contends that that passage of scripture condemns your position. And I suggest that if everybody, if you would consent to do that after this debate, why don't you let him come up on this platform and tell you what he meant by what he said, instead of you telling the brethren, we got the opportunity of him being here, and we all, incidentally, Brother Dunning and Brother DeWelt have left. They both, all of them concurred that you misrepresented them, and uh, we have an unusual opportunity. Brother Hunt's here, Brother Blakely, Fred O. Blakely's here, and if uh, you want to stay, maybe we'll take a vote after this. They can tell you what they meant by what they said, which seems pretty fair to me. Now, incidentally, when I gave the references to Saul, David, the temple, I wasn't talking about Saul, David, and the temple. I was talking about God, the God that doesn't change, the God that informs us the things that were insufficient under the old time. Yes, there was incense burned back under there, but he told us of a sweet-smelling savor that he offered his own scent, incense to himself. A sweet-smelling savor, that's what obsoleted the incense. And incidentally, yeah, that passage about the dance, that, that is an irritating passage, isn't it? Uh, because you can't, what does, I'll, I'm not a dancer, not, <laughs> I don't dance unto the Lord, but what scripture do you give for that? Uh, any of you, I think probably there's some out here, particularly young folk, Huh? What scripture do you give for not dancing to the Lord? It would be very helpful if we could codify that, print it, and put it in some samples on the back, because that's bothered people for a long, long time. Incidentally, is everything once inoffensive to God inoffensive now? Well, of course not. The things that have been fulfilled by the type uh, are no longer acceptable to him. He has a temple that he dwells in now that supersedes that temple of old. That's why it's not pleasing to him. The law, incidentally, has no application to us because we're forgiven. You understand that, don't you? The law's function was to condemn. That's what it was for, to condemn. But when we're forgiven in Christ, there is no condemnation in Christ. So now instead of the law stopping the work, incidentally, it didn't say the law was given to stop the Jew's mouth. It said it was given to stop the mouth of every man in all the world to become guilty before God. That's what the Scripture said. That's how the Holy Spirit thought. And now that you're in Christ, you have stopped the law's mouth because your condemnation's gone. That, frankly, is a wonderful thing to me. And I rejoice, rejoice in that. What do I, how do I, as a Gentile, qualify to get under the law of Moses while I become a lawless? That's how. Second like First Timothy 1 9 tells you that. It says the law is for the lawless. Huh? So you want to be under the law? Be lawless. That's who it's for. Read it. First Timothy 1 verse 9. Your law makes the music a matter of indifference. You say, well, means is a matter of indifference, but music is not. Well, who said music is not? You said it was not. God didn't say it wasn't. God's had music all along. He always has. Is there such a thing as perpetuity? And incidentally, it is ironical that God uh, 
God's covenant, not God's new covenant is I will write. It wasn't laws. Yes, he does write the laws, but he writes them on your heart. He, that's a metaphorical way, surely you must understand, of making you an agreement with God. They shall all know me, and they'll obey me, Ezekiel said, of their own, of their own will. And incidentally, what? What is generic authority? Now, I, I, you better <laughs> talk a lot about this, but this is like strange language. This is like, I can only say sibboleth in this case. I don't know what generic authority is. That's a, some kind of authority that, well, I don't know. You can explain that to me. I don't know what it is. I know about all authority, and I know about that, but not generic authority. And the one that had all authority, he didn't say what you said. So, of course, I bow the knee to him. No marriage in heaven. Well, if you don't know why there isn't, I'm glad to tell you, because there's neither male nor female in heaven. Since there is here, well, well, you already know what gender we are, but that's why we're married, because it pertains to earth, not to heaven. Now, actually, it's a travesty that we have to talk like that. I am. I, maybe other people aren't sensitive about it, but I am. I'm sensitive that people that name the name of the Lord have to act like jackasses in front of people. And I'm sorry about it. Most of these questions that are asked are foolish questions. They really are. They're not questions that God asks. He asks critical, critical questions. This list of questions here. What I want is authorization for asking the question. That's what I want. John, who wrote the book of Revelation to the seven churches, that is, is this, maybe the book of Revelation isn't in the New Testament, as you use the term. See, I don't use the term that way that book to the churches. I hope that wasn't only the seven churches, because now i got to get rid of that part of my Bible. As soon as I get the first 80%, that's not reliable resource. And now I get rid of Revelation, I don't know what else we're going to have to get rid of. Probably the gospel, too, because that occurred under the law, too, you know. There is he viewed into heaven, the presence of God. He saw those that have the name of the Father written in their forehead. Symbolism, which means that they had the mind of God. He said, I saw their harpers harping on their harps. Now, unlike people in the world, all right, that don't walk with God, God can't speak about holy things with unholy language. He can't do it and he doesn't do it. He doesn't employ speech that portrays disobedience and anarchy and lawlessness and antinomianism. He doesn't use that kind of language to portray his heavenly abode. Not at all. And it has every bit to do with us. We're a colony of him. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our heavenly call came from heaven. My hope is in heaven. My mediator is in heaven. It has all the relevance of the world. Heaven is more relevant than earth. Amen. Amen. Now, if you can't see that, you've got a problem. Because in this earth we're a stranger and a pilgrim here. We're looking for a city that has foundation, whose builder and maker is God, and the few glimpses God has given of us. I am not going to permit someone to take from me. There he saw these uh, singing a new song, standing on the shores of that sea of glass, that heavenly tranquility. He said these were those that had gained the victory over all evil influences, over all competitive things in this world. This company, this innumerable company, had gained the triumph over Satan and all of his ploys and snares. And there John sees them. They're standing on that dreadful shore. And they have the heart, not of man, not of David. They have the heart of God. And they're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Now I said that the use of musical instruments does not is in harmony with the faith of Christ or faith in Christ. And here's the people in heaven. Their faith got them there. They overcame the world by faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And they have their hearts. And they're playing before God. Now there are those that say, you folk introduced the music. And it caused division. And it's torn us asunder here upon the earth. But as I appear into the heavenly realm, they're standing upon the shore of that placid sea of glass. The harpers begin to pluck their hearts 
and it doesn't cause a ripple across that placid sea of heavenly tranquility. And if it causes it here, it's because we're unheavenly. And don't bring up the matter of incense in heaven. It's the prayers of the saints, he tells you. What is it? They have the hearts, the hearts of God. Oh, what a glorious. You see, to the extent men are disrupted by these things, they're not heavenly minded. John, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. A lot of folk don't even know what that means. In the spirit on the Lord's day, and Jesus, bless God, talked to him. Said, I turned to see the voice. Said, he spoke to me like a, like a trumpet. Like a sound of a musical instrument. Revelation 1.10. Thank God Jesus doesn't shout out of heaven that way today. He'd empty a lot of assembly houses if they heard a sound during the worship service. Like the sound of a trumpet. I'm pointing out here it's inoffensive to God. God feels comfortable using this kind of language. I, I, do you feel comfortable using it? John, the fourth chapter of Revelation, he sees an open door in heaven. <laughs> Glorious picture of the salvation that Jesus has accomplished anew in a living way to God. The veil's been rent in twain. The middle wall of partition has been taken down. Man has access to God. And he peers through that open door, extolling the vicarious sacrifice of Christ and accessibility to God. He said, the first voice I heard was as a trumpet speaking to me. He paralleled a voice with a trumpet. It's ironic that men have taught us instruments unacceptable from earth to heaven are acceptable from heaven to earth. Interesting parallel. Great <coughs> heavenly judgments are depicted as being sounded by trumpets. Revelation, the eighth chapter. Now, the relevancy of these things, as I've mentioned, is thy will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven, heaven is the abode of the Lord, where our faith rests, where our inheritance is, a church is a people being made ready for the Lord. Now God has by his word identified musical instruments with himself, three different places. First Chronicles 16, 42, the musical instrument of God. First Thessalonians 4, 14, at the resurrection, the trump of God. It's going to be some morning when the folk I, I won't say it, but it, it, it is going to be some morning to be woke up by a trumpet. And then the hearts of God in Revelation 15, because that's a long, long span of time there. Now, I've presented to you things that I believe support this proposition that I've stated. But amidst, amidst these sounds tonight of verbal warriors, and Brother Hyas and I do not dislike each other, we do not. Amidst the clash of militating concepts, a heavenly warrior bloodied by the wine press of the wrath of God moves among us, and it's the Prince of Peace. My only regret tonight is that the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me, that the holy angel would lean over the ramparts of heaven desiring to find some new aspect of redemption into which they can inquire. That in spite of the fact that the comforter has come and all things are ours and we have access to God, heaven has witnessed this week two men, two believers, Two representatives of his son in such strong disagreement. My dear friends, I'm before you now for the last address that I shall have in this discussion and the last address of the discussion itself. Brother Blakely ended his remarks a few minutes ago by saying what a shame and what a tragedy it is 
that two men who purport to be speaking for Christ should stand before you in such strong disagreement. But I submit for your consideration there is a tragedy greater still, and that is that a man should stand before you now four nights, speech after speech after speech, and have someone beg and beseech and implore him to give book, chapter, and verse for that which he practices, and he has allowed this debate to close without ever giving any such passage. I asked for it beginning on the first night. I said, uh, if Brother Blakely could give us the verse of Scripture that justifies his practice or that authorizes his practice or that shows his practice is scriptural, he could bring this debate to a conclusion the very first night. All we're asking for is the citation from the Word of God, the passage of Scripture that God has given. But he has been before us, and he's been before us time now and time again until his time is no more in this debate, and he has never to this good hour given that passage. And I think all of us may very well understand why. We know that had he had such a passage, he would have given it. And so he talks about the tragedy of the disagreement. I speak about the tragedy of one who cannot obey what Peter enjoined in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that lies within you, yet with meekness and fear. This man has asked him for that reason again and again and again in this discussion. And he's talked to us about many things that were irrelevant. He's discussed many things that had no bearing on the proposition. He has consistently ignored the arguments, the passages, and the charts that I have given. And he has allowed his time to close without ever affirming the proposition that he signed his name to affirm. And then he said uh, that I had quoted uh, Brother Fred Blakely and others. He said, uh, let's let them get up and tell what they meant by what they said rather than to hear my interpretation of it. But you know, the interesting thing about that is I haven't given my interpretation of it. I have given precisely what they said. And I know that it has hurt. And I know that it has been injurious to their cause. And I know that it has been embarrassing. And I regret that that is the case. But the fact of the matter is that down through the years, they have taught something different to what Brother Given Blakely has endeavored to affirm in this debate, and that's the reason for their embarrassment. I have shown how that Brother DeWell taught that uh, worship must be directed by truth. This man said there's no regulation of worship in the New Testament. He got up here the other night and attacked the proposition that I signed because it talked about mechanical instruments of music. And I showed him where that uh, Brother Dunning affirmed a proposition with those very words in it. He objected because I used the expression Christian worship, and he said it was unscriptural terminology, and furthermore, it was ungodly. I gave this article from his father, Fred O. Blakely, where that he talked about Christian worship. I know they have changed, and I know that he has departed the ground that they formerly endeavored to occupy. And I know that he has renounced and repudiated the very positions that they have endeavored to give in the past. Let me tell you something else about that, friends, that I think is so, so very important. This not only means that he's repudiated his debaters of the past. This not only means that he's repudiated the teaching that his father has done in the past. This not only means that he's forsaken the ground that they've occupied in the past, but please bear this in mind. This also shows the direction in which the independent Christian churches are moving, and therein also lies the tragedy. They're moving in the same direction as the liberal left-wing modernistic disciples of Christ denomination. And Brother Blakely's come closer to their position in this debate than any man of his fellowship that I've ever heard. They've been saying for years you didn't have to have authority. We've always been book, chapter, and verse people. We've always said, let us go to the law and to the testimony. And let us go to the light of God's Word. He has come tonight and come very near, if not altogether, to taking the position of the liberal disciples of Christ organization. And if he follows his own doctrine to its conclusion, it'll lead him there or beyond. He referred to Saul, David, in the temple again. He said, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about God. Uh, he uh, may be talking about God, but he's talking about God in his dealing with people in the former covenant. He said, we don't have incense today because we have a sweet-smelling savor. Oh, my, that is the very point, Brother Blakely. You're saying we don't have the Old Testament influence because we've been given something better, so we don't have that incense now. We have something that's been given to us in the new, but that's precisely my position. Why can't he see that? 
That's the very point I'm making. That you don't have the incense brought over into the new. You're given something else. You're given something better. And so it is under the new covenant system. There is a system of spiritual worship. Ephesians 5 and verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. What did he say about that? I presented a chart on it tonight, not one word. Colossians 3 and verse 16, I presented a chart on that tonight. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. What did he say about that? He did not call for the chart. He did not mention the verse of Scripture. Notice how many times he said, give us something about uh, where there was any organized uh, or group worship in the New Testament. Give us one verse, Brother Harris. He had on a chart just one single verse of Scripture will do. Tonight I gave him Acts 20 and verse 7. When they gathered together to break bread upon the first day of the week. I gave him 1 Corinthians 11 verses 24 and 25. The other night he said there was no command to take uh, of the bread and the fruit of the vine. I gave him those verses then and uh, he did not deal with them then. He has not dealt with them now. Again and again and again I've given him passage after passage for everything that he's asked for. And yet he's ignored the arguments that I've made. Then he said, uh, Romans 3 and verse 19 says, not that they might convict the Jews, but convict all the world by the law. He does not recognize the context. It begins by showing that the Gentiles are under sin. It then proceeds in the context to show that the Jews are under sin. It then concludes that all the world is under sin. Romans 3 and verse 9, we've laid to the charge of both Jew and Gentile that all are under sin, but he proves it separately. And he proves that the Jews are under sin because he says, whatsoever things the law says, it says to them that are under the law. What did he say tonight about how he as a Gentile or any other Gentile ever got under the law of Moses? Why such an idea is preposterous to anybody who has studied the right division of the Word of God. And I begged him and I beseeched him to give us an answer to that, but not one word did he say. Then he said to me that I said eating meats was a matter of indifference. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 8. You said nothing about it. He said, who says music is not a matter of indifference? The Apostle Paul said it in Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, 16. Uh, he said, what about generic authority? He had never heard of such a thing as that. Well, specific authority is authority that specifies. Generic authority is that which is general. I think that's simple enough. Some things do not specify the tales. They give a general statement. Others are specific in nature. And uh, we have specific authority to sing and make melody in our hearts under the Lord. And uh, that is as specific as could be about music. He said some say there are two kinds of music. He denied it. He said there's one sound. Didn't make any difference. That one sound was made up of two the uh, instrument and the vocal music on that occasion. Then he said uh, that God's will should be done on earth as it is in heaven. I showed it's God's will that there be uh, no marriage in heaven. And he said there'd be uh, neither male nor female in heaven. Well, certainly that is enough in itself to show that everything's not the same on earth as it is in heaven. And then he said heaven is relevant. Well, it may be relevant, but it is not authority for the worship of the New Testament church. In the first place, uh, whoever got the idea that spiritual uh, saints of God Almighty and the heavenly state are going to play on material hearts? Uh, the very fact that he refers to that in the heavenly state, where do they buy the strings for them, Brother Blakely? Well, they order those from the catalog. The very idea of the saints of God sitting up in the heavenly of heavenlies in the high and holy presence of God Almighty and playing on a literal heart. It's an answer to the argument he made. I'm not presenting any new material, but I've got a right to answer what he said. He presented this material in his last speech. I certainly believe I've got a right to respond to what he said. I know it's warm over there. <laughs> now, he referred to uh, the fact that the hearts would be in heaven. I pointed out to him he makes the same argument the Sabbatarians do. Now watch how he follows it. They said it's before the law, during the law, and in the heavenly state. He says the same thing about music that they say about the Sabbath. That's the way they argue about it. We came along tonight and he argued about the fact that it speaks about the harps of God. Doesn't say the harps of David. Doesn't say the harps of the Old Testament. He said it says the harps of God. Why, well, in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10, it talks about the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In Leviticus 23 and verse 3, it talks about the Sabbath of God. Does that prove anything in the world? Not one thing. And I presented that chart and asked him to show how that his argument would justify the instrument of music and rule out the uh, Sabbatarian argument on Sabbath observance. What did he say about it? 
Not a single solitary word. As he did time and again with the arguments presented, he talked about the trumpet that summoned people. That's not even in the worship. That'd be like a church bell that rings out the uh, time of the meeting. Would not be anything involved in the worship at all. He uh, talked about uh, the incense in heaven. He said will be the prayers of the saints. He didn't look at the verse I gave. He's thinking about Revelation 5 and verse 8, but I gave Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4, which says no such thing, and he paid no attention to that. Remember, the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. Remember that the uh, pictures and images are vividly presented there to represent truths and ideas to the persecuted church of the first century, and he's unable to take those uh, items that are there and to translate those into the notion of authority for such worship in the New Testament church. Uh, then he made uh, another reference or so here that I uh, used one word I'll not uh, refer to. The uh, sad thing to me about all of this is, let me see chart number 10. Some uh, 200 years ago, a group of men arose on this continent who were weary of human creeds and sectarian names, laying aside uh, pride and giving everything they had. They determined to know nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'll not have to have it. They took as their motto, let us speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. And across this land and country they went preaching and debating in schoolhouses, church houses and brush arbors. The great personal sacrifice they proclaimed to return to undenominational Christianity of the first century. And my friends, the principles they preached took its toll on their lives. Many of them restudied infant sprinkling in the gospel plan of salvation. They gave up whatever they could not find authorized in the scriptures. And they had no mechanical instruments of music in their worship, not because they were prejudiced or small-minded men, not because they were ignorant or unlearned backwoodsmen. Many of them were scholars. Not because they were pitiful misfits of society as we have often been characterized to be but because they devoted themselves to the principle, let God be true, and every man a liar. And that spiritual army moved across this land, tearing down strongholds and calling men back to the Bible. And thousands were converted and baptized into Christ. What a mighty work. But in 1859, a little melodeon made its way into the church at Midway, Kentucky. And a once great brotherhood was split to its roots. J.W. McGarvey, one of the great pioneers of the restoration movement, said it is manifest that we cannot adopt the practice of using instrumental music without abandoning the obvious and only ground on which a restoration of primitive Christianity can be accomplished on which the plea for it can be maintained. Such is my profound conviction, and consequently the question with me is not one concerning the choice or rejection of an expedient, but the maintenance or abandonment of a fundamental and necessary principle. I hold that the use of the instrument is sinful, and I must not be requested to keep my mouth shut in the presence of sin, whether committed by a church or an individual. Apostolic Times, 1881. I asked these questions earlier in the week. They were never answered. How can we plead with others to give up doctrines and practices unknown to the New Testament if we ourselves adopt that for which there is no scriptural authority? If it is our plea for people to come back to the New Testament in doctrine and practice, how can we call them back to a practice which is not in the New Testament? How can we restore a practice which was not in the New Testament church? Is it possible to restore what never was there? Think on these things. Something finally to the audience. I had thought to mention this before and, and had forgot to. 
Uh, Brother Harris had permitted me to select my own proposition during this debate. It may seem trite, but uh, he was the first one that would. And I, I really do, Brother Harris, I thank you for that, for letting me couch my proposition in my own words. I commend uh, all of you for being here and for your commendable uh, attitude during this. For some of you, I know this has been a difficult time. Maybe there's some sensitive souls among us. But uh, I, this was not intended to be personal, as has already been stated. I had mentioned to Brother Deffenbaugh a thought that, would you mind if I said this publicly, Brother Don? That uh, I had suggested that I invite Brother Hires or someone comparable to this, to him, of his selection, to meet here in 1989 at a convenient time to discuss the covenants. I, it is my persuasion that this is where our essential difference lies. And I, I think um, a very profitable time could be spent in that, and I, I present that as a suggestion. Uh, it may not necessarily have to be a debate as such, but something to get these perspectives of what the new covenant is from our various perspectives. Again, thank you for your attention. the elders of the church here decide to do uh, with their own affairs is up to them and I'll leave that to them. I have an idea that my brethren are pretty well satisfied with uh, what has taken place and uh, I know that I am. I would mention however that uh, in the Spiritual Sword magazine, copies of which are here, there's already a signed proposition in there uh, challenging Brother uh, Dunning for a discussion and so maybe something could be done along that line. Brother Deber's already signed that. I wanted to say just some personal things here. I'm content with the debate, willing to let that uh, rest with you and all others who've had the opportunity to hear and those who will uh, see the uh, videotapes and hear the audio tapes and read the book uh, in time to come. But I particularly want to express my appreciation to uh, Don and Mary Deffenbaugh. They have been incredible. I don't know how they've done all they've done. They're just uh, such gracious people and uh, they present such a good image of the church here, I scarcely see how a better representation to the community could be made than the uh, one that they give and uh, to the visitors and to all who've been a part. And they certainly have just done everything conceivable to make things easier for me 